Now, we are going to go into chapter 31, section 1, which is, historically for me, a change-up lesson. Uh, so things are going to be a little bit different. I want you to work with me here today. We're going to be bouncing back and forth from several documents, and I'm also going to be able to show you pages from your textbook today. I would encourage you to pause the video, uh, take down some notes. This video will only be up today. It will self-destruct as you could say, Inspector Gadget, uh, after a certain time period here momentarily. So you're only going to have this until about 1130 tonight. So I want you to watch it, pause it, uh, write down some of the charts that I'm going to introduce. This is the only place you can find those charts. Okay, so the first order of business is what we're going to do here is we're going to do the Interact with History. It's found on page 896. So I would encourage all of you, if you have your book at home, to do that. But I'm going to show it to you uh, right here momentarily and uh, I'll read the statements for you and uh, I want you to kind of contemplate in your mind how you would be thinking if we were doing this in class and you were able to raise your hand and give me a response I'd like you to actually maybe write that response down into your notebook paper okay so we're gonna go back we're gonna do this in a minute but we're gonna go back here to the opening section and we've got uh, the interact with history here and it says, which candidate will you choose? I'm going to read this to you, so follow along with me. On a spring evening in the early 1930s, during the Great Depression, you are one of thousands of Germans gathered at an outdoor stadium in Munich. You are unemployed. Your country is suffering. Like everyone else, you have come to this mass meeting to hear two politicians campaigning for office. Huge speakers blare out patriotic music while you and the rest of the crowd wait impatiently for the speeches to begin. Before long, you will have to cast your ballot. Guys, just to pause it for station identification here, what a scary thought. Hopefully, we do not have to do something like this here in the near future. Hopefully, everything will sort of bounce back and, and over time, we'll gradually get back to where we were before. But you have to know that the Treaty of Versailles, coming out of World War I, experiencing the economic downturn and the Great Depression, was an extremely difficult time period for peoples in the 1930s. This in Germany is going to be the case. We're gonna talk a lot about that. And uh, let's take a look. Here are the two candidates, and these are their platforms. Now a candidate's platform is basically the ideas, the ideals that they are running on. So let's take a look at the first candidate's platform first. Here are some of the bullet points in that candidate's platform. Hey, remember Germany's long and glorious past. Replace our present indecisive leadership with a strong, effective leader. Rebuild the army to protect against enemies. Regain the lands taken unfairly from us. Make sacrifices to return to economic health and put the welfare of the state above all and our country will be a great power again. The first candidate's platform seems to definitely go against the stipulations of the Treaty of Versailles. Remember, that the one big point here is with the army. Germany after World War I was restricted in how much a military preparation they could have. So you're looking at the first candidate's platform saying a lot of things that go against the Treaty of Versailles. The second candidate's platform is a little bit different. Realize that there are no simple or quick solutions to problems. Put people back to work, but understand economic recovery will be slow. Provide for the poor, elderly, and the sick Avoid reckless military spending, act responsibly to safeguard democracy, and be a good neighbor country. Honor our debts and our treaty commitments. The second candidate's platform seems to really be going along with the Treaty of Versailles, following all of the stipulations, under, trying to get the people to understand that we will recover economically, but it's not going to be a quick recovery. Notice what was stated about the military. Avoid reckless military spending. So you can see a, a stark difference, a juxtaposition between these two candidates. However, I want you to think about it. if you were a German during this depression, knowing that you had to show up to a store to buy one loaf of bread with four or five wheelbarrows full of cash money, that's how bad uh, economic inflation was in Germany during this time, which candidate would you wanna hear? Most Germans wanted to hear the platform of candidate one. And in essence, what your textbook's trying to do here is get you to decide. When I do this in class, I say, okay, everybody put your heads down. 
and let's vote anonymously. Go ahead and put your hands up if you want to vote for candidate one. In my experience, 75% of students will vote for candidate one. The problem with that is you're essentially voting for Adolf Hitler. That was Hitler's platform basically here stated in the textbook. You can sort of put two and two together with the picture that is there. Okay, gentlemen, I hope that you're comprehending that. That's a nice little exercise to start chapter 31. Back to the basic lesson here, which is going to be found in the outline that I'm posting. There are four points which basically explain, hey, uh, why, why is it important to study chapter 31? What are some of the big ideas that come from chapter 31? Okay, we're going to move on down in through the lesson. You can see that I've got an outline here, but it's not like one of our normal outlines where there are many points and key terms and things of that nature. Roman numeral one is going to talk about the primary source that you can find on page 898. If you're following along with your textbook at home, go ahead and get yourself there. If you are following along on the screen, I am going to take us there now. Excuse my scrolling, gentlemen. It's, uh, it's the best that I can do. But here we are at this uh, primary source box. This is about F. Scott Fitzgerald and what was known as the Writers of the Lost Generation. I'm going to read this to you, so follow along with me. During the 1920s, many American writers, musicians, and painters left the United States to live in Europe. These expatriates, people who left their native country to live elsewhere, often settled in places like Paris. American writer Gertrude Stein called them the lost generation. They moved frantically from one European city to another, trying to find meaning in life. Life empty of meaning is one of the many themes of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, which came about in 1925. Let's take a look at a small excerpt from The Great Gatsby. If you have not read it yet in your English class, it's a classic. It's one that talks about the Roaring Twenties and it's one that talks about a great deal of anticipation of the future. So we're gonna take a look at this primary source, and I really want you to think deep about what the inner messages are of just this small excerpt. And as I sat there brooding on the old unknown world, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him, somewhere back in that vast obscurity beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. Gatsby believed in the green light, the future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and one fine morning. So we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. There's a lot of imagery here. We see the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. Now, docks have these lights that warn boats not to, to basically run into them or where they could line themselves up. One of the things that you want to take a look at here is there are green lights and there are red lights. When we take a look at green lights, we usually think go, go forward, proceed into the future. When we see red lights, generally mean stop. So we're talking about going forward here um, if you're just looking at this different imagery. Okay, now, also, I think it's important to look at some of these questions here. The first one says, what seems to be the narrator's attitude toward the future? That's a really good one, taking a look at this excerpt. Basically, what I gather from this, and I know that you're entitled to gather your own opinion here, but it kind of sounds to me like the future is rather elusive. It's something that's unreachable. It's full of a lot of promise, but uh, technically speaking, a lot of it can never really be fulfilled, and we don't know if it's going to be fulfilled. So the second question kind of leads into that, too. How would you describe the overall mood of the excerpt? It's kind of sad. I mean, if you look at the last question here, so we beat on boats against the current. Now, those of you guys that are on the crew team know rowing against the current has got to make it a, a bit more difficult, right? Uh, so we're talking about hard times here and then born back ceaselessly into the past. So the whole idea is we're trying to follow this green light. We're trying to go forward. We're trying to run faster, stretch out our arms farther. 
But unfortunately, the way that at least this excerpt ends, that current is driving us back into the past. I think about this when we talked about World War One. we talked about all the great technological advancements, right? Where did it really get us? Well, it got us into a war where all of that technology didn't do a whole lot other than kill more people. Uh, so I think maybe there's a little bit of a reference there. Uh, but, but once again, this is just me. I want you to take a look at this and think about historically what you've learned in this class and what you're going to learn about in this chapter, how that sort of relates there. Okay, let's jump back to our general plan here. Uh, Roman numeral two says, reproduce the key terms chart on uh, page 899. Now, this is a message for me. This is found on the teacher's edition only. So you guys will not have this chart in your textbook. So what I did is I reproduced it for you right here. So what you see, and this is where, like I was saying earlier, this is only going to be found here. You're not going to see this anywhere else. It's not in the outline that I posted. So here's where I would suggest stopping the video. Uh, hopefully when you pause it, you can see your screen and then definitely writing down these things here, creating this chart, recreating this chart in your notes. So a couple of terms, I'm going to go over this quickly because I'm asking you to write it down and I've already asked you to read this section as well. So these terms are there. I just wanted to, because these are some uh, rather new terms for us, talk about them briefly. Existentialism. I know that if you had Mr. Zarnecki, uh, possibly Mr. Kenrick for English class as a freshman or possibly a sophomore, you will have learned about this. Uh, but it's really kind of the belief that people make their own meaning of life. There's really no set standard meaning of life. For us as Christians, I think this one's a little bit tough to understand, a little bit tough to comprehend because, you know, for us, there's definitely a meaning in life. Um, and um, that that that's a, existentialism it could be quite a, a conundrum to think about there. How does it reflect the time that we're learning? Well, it shows that there are reactions to an uncertain world. People don't know how the world is going to be. And if they're existentialists, they, uh, you know, they don't believe that there's a true meaning in life. So people are going to react to the world in different ways. And that's still true today. Surrealism now is actually an art form. It's an art form based on images from the unconscious. There's a subconscious and there's an unconscious. These are basically thoughts that you're, happy, you're having deep inside your mind, but you don't really understand or you don't really recollect or recognize that you're having these thoughts. Uh, so how do you create art there? Well, surrealists, uh, I think they have more of a plan than they'll admit to, but you know, there's some painters that throw paint cans at the canvas and then, and then they call that a work of art. And then they'll say, oh, well, you know, in my mind, I was aiming the paint cans here. It's really odd, but I'll show you some examples uh, later on in the chapter. It basically, it's a new, it uses a lot of new ideas, new images, new forms. There are some technical paintings that we're going to see later in the in the chapter. Jazz is a music. It's a style of music. It's a loose, free style of music. One of the things about it, it's a lot of improv with jazz, a lot of unplanned music, which kind of goes along really well with some of these other terms, but it breaks with the general discipline and order of music in general and, of course, uh, uh, of life in general. Okay, we're going to switch back. Here, we have a brief lesson on how women's role began to change during this time period. So this is really interesting to take a look at. I'll go through these points really quickly. You know, during the 1920s, a lot of young people, men and women alike, were really willing to break tradition and experiment with what we call more modern values. Something that's going on today, a lot of people have uh, these generational things that, that they want to break away from maybe what their parents did, maybe what their grandparents did. American women in particular protest and march to earn suffrage, remember, that means voting rights, until they were granted the right to vote in 1920, so after World War I, guys. The war allowed women to take on many new roles as well. They really did a lot of work in factories to replace the many male soldiers that were off fighting in the war. And uh, this is one of the big reasons that gained them a lot of respect and helped solidify their voting rights. Female suffrage in the United States, Great Britain, Germany, Sweden, and Austria. These are some of the first places that women gathered the voting rights just after World War I. Uh, women began to dress a little bit differently during this time, 1920s, early 1930s. They wore less restrictive clothing and, and hairstyles began to become shorter and, and a little bit different. They also began to wear makeup in public. They started to drive cars for themselves, drink alcohol and smoke cigarettes out in public. This is something that uh, didn't generally happen as much before these time periods. Many women also broke from the traditional roles of family and marriage 
One of the reasons for this is the advent of birth control, which was advocated by Margaret Sanger and Emma Goldman, who risked arrest and, and, and other things to represent their cause there. Uh, now we know that that is a, a big touchy subject with the Catholic Church, and so that's uh, something to take a look at the history of birth control and the women's rights movement here and the family roles that we've learned about throughout history. Now, new careers for women did also come about in medicine, education, and also journalism. And one of the big terms that was going on back in those times were flappers in the 1920s. These were known as stylish women that dressed with less restriction. There should be two S's there. That's a sign of weakness by me, I apologize. Uh, the word represents a bird breaking out of its nest for the first time and beginning to fly. So these young women became a symbol of the era's rebellious youth. They were called flappers because this is a time period in which women were gaining writing votes, uh, voting rights, I'm sorry. Whoa, uh, sign of weakness. Uh, but also you have women who are kind of getting out of the general traditional gender roles here and doing different things. And that's why that is there. I've got another chart for you here. Roman numeral four says the uh, the chart on page 900 of my edition once again, which is which is called the effects of technology. So I will take you to that chart, kind of like uh, this chart here. What I want you to do is make sure that you kind of listen in and copy down some of this information into your notes as this will be the only time today only this will be available to you. So the effects of technology during this time period Cars. People began to travel for pleasure. You know, they started taking trips through the states, stopping off here and there. Um, so new businesses developed to serve travelers. Hotels, motels, gas stations, uh, convenience stores. These are all things that came about during this time. Workers moved to suburbs and then drove their cars into cities for jobs. Airplanes. This is when major passenger airlines were established prior to this. Large-scale planes usually were just for shipping or, or for military purposes, but now you're going to have passenger airlines coming into play. International travel became a possibility, okay? Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, they sort of opened up traveling across the Atlantic Ocean, right? Uh, that's what I'm talking about with the pioneering, pioneering pilots there, and you can read that in the section. Radio became a big deal. Radio stations began to flourish. You know, they, they ran uh, commercial radio stations where... You know, every so often they interrupt this uh, message for, or we, we interrupt this program for a, uh, a sponsorship message here. So that's where commercials came and that's how radios made money and still do today. People had readily available access to news, entertainment, other information. You know, all, all of your big time things were on the radio before you had television. You might listen to sports on the radio. You might listen to like a, a series on the radio. Maybe, uh, you know, you would listen to like a Zorro or uh, some other type of adventures that these are some of the early uh, radio broadcasts. Movies. Movies came about. They provided a new, another new form of entertainment. With the addition of sound now, they gained a wider appeal and impact. The, the jazz singer is one of the first what were called talkies. These were movies that also had voice synchronized in with them, and that began around 1927. Okay. We'll go back to our general lesson here. Okay, finally today, uh, briefly, we're going to go over Salvador Dali, the painting on page 899 in your textbook. So I'll jump to that. It is on the next page right here. This is called the Persistence of Memory. I told you I'd have an example of surrealist art. This was by the Sp famous Spanish artist Salvador Dali, and basically it shows watches melting in some sort of a desert. Now, I did take art history in college, and uh, what you do in art history class is you basically, the professor comes in with maybe 20, 30 slides of famous uh, paintings and photographs or other uh, projects from throughout history, and you, you look at it and you kind of say, oh, what, what was the author trying to portray here? And people come up with some of the wildest things. To be honest with you, I, uh, I I really didn't catch a lot of what they were saying, so I was pretty quiet in the class. I, it was a good experience, and I would suggest doing it uh, for you guys if you get to take an elective in college or if you're a history major, you're going to have to, like I was. Uh, but what can you gather from this? You know, we, we took a look at some of the other ideas there, uh, talking about going into the future, but here we see time kind of standing still. It looks like the clock is generally in the same spot in all of these pictures. 
Not sure what this platform is here. We've got a platform here, a flat platform with a tree growing on it with the clock. We've got uh, some type of uh, uh, pocket watch here, looks like. Uh, it looks like there might be some flies or some other things flying around on it. We've got this piece of cloth that kind of looks like it's got a some type of an eye or wrinkle here. Kind of hard to decipher what's going on here. What is going on? What is the idea here of Salvador Dali? Now, you know, he didn't talk much about this painting, so a lot of people have their different perceptions, but, you know, it sort of shows time disintegrating. And this was during a time, you know, 1931, where there were some hardships. You know, many people had lost their lives in World War I, and everybody was trying to piece together. You had the Great Depression hitting. You've got people having to ration goods. You've got uh, banks failing. You've got droughts in the United States. You've got uh, farmers unable to pay their loans back to banks, so banks couldn't get out, give other people money. We're going to learn about net, that in this chapter. But, you know, there's something to be said for this. I'm going to let you guys sort of take a look at this painting and, and see what you what you sort of come up with. Let me know in the comments or maybe the discussion board this week, and uh, I'd like to see what you guys think. All right, fellas, the uh, the basic homework for for today is uh, simply to read the next section, which is going to be section two, and we'll be back to our normal lesson uh, for the next few. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a wonderful day.